In September of 2018, a mysterious threat began to emerge in the tiny remote town of Sunspot, New Mexico, located deep within the Lincoln National Forest. This mysterious threat would escalate so much that the Sunspot Observatory, the threat's point of origin, and the surrounding community were evacuated for 11 days, a choice that would bring the situation international attention in the news. All this speculation about what could have been happening in the area would eventually culminate with the arrest of one man, a janitor named Joshua Coe. And the official story of what this janitor had done to elicit such an overt response from the authorities had all the trademarks of a government conspiracy movie straight out of Hollywood. I'm Max, this is Parasite TV, now let's jump into the wild story surrounding the mysterious closure of the Sunspot Observatory. On September 9th, 2018, a sleepy, secluded community, Otero County, New Mexico, was shaken by the announcement that Aura, the organization that operates the two observatories that employ most of the residents in the area, had suddenly made the decision to evacuate both the Sunspot Observatory and the Apache Point Observatory due to an unknown threat. This obviously prompted a response from the local sheriff's department who at this point had received no calls for help from any employees at either facility. As then Otero County Sheriff Benny House arrived on the scene, he was beyond surprised to find Black Hawk helicopters patrolling the area, out of town workers surrounding the facility's antennas, and work crews scaling the towers, all under the authority of several FBI agents. At first, Sheriff House wasn't told anything. No matter who he asked, no one from Aura, the FBI, or any of the workers on the scene would tell him what was going on. The following are quotes made by Sheriff House to the Alamogordo Daily News at the time. The FBI is refusing to tell us what's going on. We've got people up there that requested us to stand by while they evacuate it. Nobody would really elaborate on the circumstances as to why the FBI were up there, what their purpose was, nobody will say. But for the FBI to get involved that quick and be so secretive about it, there was a lot of stuff going on up there. There was a Black Hawk helicopter, a bunch of people around antennas, and work crews on towers, but nobody would tell us anything. Nobody would identify any specific threat. We hung out for a little while and then we left. No reason for us to be there. Nobody would tell us what we're supposed to be watching out for. At the time, Sheriff House also elaborated on the situation, saying he was confused because although the facilities were technically federally owned, the workers were not federal, and he was rightfully perplexed as to what could have happened that the FBI was there so quickly without the Sheriff's Department ever being notified that anything was going on. There were also early reports of a second group of agents that were more focused on the Sunspot Post Office, although they may have just been using the building as a base of operations. Almost immediately, the news media caught wind of what was going on and began reporting on the strange incident at the Sunspot Observatory. And just like that, the theory train was full steam ahead. Interestingly, a few days before the event on September 6th, the observatory website was abruptly taken offline, along with dozens of other websites for solar research facilities. A small detail uncovered and speculated on by the conspiracy communities on Reddit and 4chan. This was apparently important to the situation, as these observatory websites are used as hubs of information, and usually make even their most recent data public. In order to keep information about the sun and solar system as up-to-date as possible, many observatories even offering live streams via webcam of whatever they're observing. So these live feeds suddenly going dark all at the same time seemed like a huge red flag at the time. The initial theories were varied, but pretty much all branched off the idea that these observatories had witnessed some kind of ominous event in space that the government really, really didn't want becoming public knowledge. According to theorists, this would explain the very abrupt evacuation, an attempt to detain workers and debrief them on what they may have witnessed, the taking over of the post office to ensure no evidence was mailed out of town, and the website closures, of course, to prevent any further spreading of whatever this knowledge may have been. But what could they be trying to cover up? 
Well, speculation ranged from an impending massive solar flare that would end civilization as we know it, to the possibility of a colossal mothership decloaking in Earth's orbit, and the site's most captivating building, a pyramidal white obelisk that stands 136 foot tall, also stretches 220 feet below ground, which led to a lot of speculation of there being a bigger, classified set of structures deep underground, otherwise known as deep underground military bases, with one of the entrances being within the Sunspot Complex. There were also rampant claims that the closure was related to Planet X or Nibiru, a conspiracy theory tied in with the whole ancient aliens Anunnaki thing, claiming that eventually a rogue planet would enter our solar system and collide with Earth. There were also some fascinating anomalies occurring with the Earth's magnetosphere at the time, which only shoveled more charcoal into the engine of the theory train. See what I did there? Because earlier I said the thing about the theory train and then I brought it back with the... Now there was never any hard evidence of any of these claims, but as someone that was absolutely glued to this event as it was unfolding, due to website after website going dark, threads about the subject being locked or sometimes seemingly sanitized off the internet, and the FBI's overt response and refusal to comment on the situation, it really seemed like something big was coming. The questions surrounding the Sunspot Observatory's mysterious closure and evacuation just kept growing with each passing day, and many people that had become obsessed with this topic, like myself at the time, realized the sky hadn't fallen, we hadn't been incinerated by solar flares, and our alien overlords weren't finally revealing themselves to humanity, yet. It was like this confounding event occurred that had seemingly proven that X-Files-esque conspiracy theories really do exist and occur in real time. But like most good conspiracy theories, it consisted only of questions that would remain unanswered. That was until the official story began to surface. The FBI finally broke their silence and revealed that the entire Sunspot Observatory complex and its surrounding community had been evacuated for 11 days, the hardware taken over, the tower scaled, the Black Hawk helicopters flown in, and the FBI had basically invaded this small town, all due to one person, a janitor named Joshua Cope, who was employed at the research facility. And unsurprisingly, the FBI's official story about why they had done all of this would only make things stranger and more suspicious in the eyes of many that had been following the event closely. According to the FBI, Joshua Cope had been caught in the possession of, and with the intent to distribute, child SA material. And it doesn't explain very much, does it? And at the time, they did not elaborate whatsoever on why this needed such an overt response, why the community was evacuated, or why the post office had to be taken over. The following is the official story of how the FBI caught super criminal Joshua Coe, according to what was revealed in testimony given during his trial in 2022. One day in March of 2018, chief observer at the facility, Doug Gillum, noticed a strange light between a desktop computer and a wall. He realized the light was an LED shining from a small Lenovo computer, cracked open like a book and wedged in between the desktop computer and the wall. Curious, he grabbed the laptop and removed it from its hiding place, and the display came on. At first, he didn't really recognize whatever he was looking at, so he rotated the laptop. And when he rotated the laptop, he realized he was looking at a picture of female genitalia. And almost as soon as he realized what he was looking at, the display flashed and the image changed. This new image was of a young boy standing in a dimly lit room, wearing only his underwear, a t-shirt, and a cat mask. And as he was staring, kind of perplexed at this bizarre image, the screen flashed once again and went dark, without any physical input on the keyboard or anything from Doug. Now, although he thought this whole thing was bizarre, he needed to get back to work. So he actually put the laptop back in its hiding spot and just kind of moved on. But as he drove home that night, he kind of thought about it and thought, well, obviously that's not appropriate for the workplace, but I don't think it was anything illegal. So he kept quiet. Around two weeks later, Chief Observer Doug found the laptop once again, this time hidden under a desk, and he noticed again the LED lights were on, but this time nothing would pop up on the display. And again, he put the laptop back in its new hiding place. He found the laptop a third time another two weeks after he found it the second time. This time plugged in and hidden on a bookshelf behind some books. And again, he did nothing. During the trial, Cope's defense lawyer asked if this strange laptop was something Gillum probably should have reported. And he replied, yeah. 
probably. He found the laptop hidden in various locations around the facility three more times. But the fifth time he discovered the laptop, all the university students that come to work at the facility for the summer had left for the season. And at that point, only a few employees actually had access to the building the laptop was in. Two of those employees being Doug Gillum and Joshua Cope. This fifth time, it just so happens that Gillum's boss happened to call just after he had once again discovered this mysterious laptop. His boss asked how things had been going, and Doug decided it was finally time to divulge what he now believed may be an issue. I mean, yeah man, finding someone's personal porno computer at the federal facility you work at five times is probably something you should bring up. So Doug discussed this strange laptop mystery with his boss, who encouraged him that he should probably try to find out who it belonged to. So Gillum began to investigate the laptop's IP address, but was almost immediately interrupted by a phone call from the FBI. Now, according to the FBI, state and federal authorities had been keeping their eye on the Sunspot facility for some time. Due to the illegal activity they suspected this laptop was being used for. Apparently, Owen Pena, a special agent from the New Mexico Attorney General's Office Internet Crimes Against Children Unit, had been using law enforcement software to detect peer-to-peer -peer sharing of child essay material had stumbled across some suspicious activity attached to an IP address that belonged to the Sunspot Observatory. In Pena's words, the laptop was on all the time and was eating up a ton of space on their law enforcement software. In cases like this, investigators actually try to download suspected child essay material from whoever they think may have it and be sharing it, thus catching them not only with possession but in the act of distribution. Up until this point, Agent Pena had been unable to get this laptop to share the suspected material with him. But apparently, special agent in charge, Pena's boss, Jay Ratliff, who also testified was able to get some of this material shared from the laptop. Eventually, this special investigations unit was able to partially download two what they called files of interest. And once Gillum began to investigate the situation, it seems like they got in touch with him and the observatory was notified about what may be going on. But because the Sunspot Observatory is technically a federal facility, this case actually belonged to the FBI. In early August of 2018, Agent Lisa Kite Hill, who at the time worked for the Las Cruces field office, was made aware of the situation. When Hill contacted Chief Observer Gillum, she instructed him to find some reason to shut the facility down for a few hours, and told him to leave the laptop right where it was, doing whatever it was doing, and that she would drive there as fast as she could. Although it remained unstated during the trial, whatever the reason was, Doug Gillum came up with some reason to shut the facility down and met with Lisa Kite Hill. Interestingly, at this point, Hill didn't take the laptop either. She just took a few photos of it with her FBI-issued phone. She then instructed Gillum to lock the door to the room that contained the laptop, keep his eyes open, and take note of any strange behavior from any of the employees. At this point, it seems clear that the FBI did not have a person of interest and nothing really tied back to Cope. And strangely, in response to these requests, Gillum only had one question. He asked if he could wipe his fingerprints off the laptop, which Agent Hill told him absolutely not. It was after this development that, according to Gillum, Cope became absolutely enraged. Bizarrely, Gillum also claims that when Cope couldn't access his laptop, he made some kind of veiled threat that there could be a serial killer in the area, and he was worried that the killer might break into the facility and kill some of the employees. Bizarrely, Gillum admitted during cross-examination that no one else that was employed at the facility would know anything about these threats or about Cope becoming enraged because he only really talked to Gillum about it. Suspiciously, Agent Hill's photos of the laptop in its original state in the location that it was found in never made it into evidence because she didn't download them from her phone to her computer and the FBI upgraded her to a new phone and wiped the old one. The only photos of the laptop that exist and were shown during trial were taken in an FBI temporary evidence lockup room. But there was a problem with this as well. FBI Special Agent John Durham was tasked with finding out who actually owned this laptop. When he began investigating, he found that the only user profile was simply identified as owner. And although he did find two folders that contained 25 pieces of suspected child essay material, his logs also revealed that the laptop had been accessed remotely twice after it had been in FBI custody. 
but before it was moved into the regional computer forensics lab where he was conducting his investigation. Durham found that two hours after Agent Hill had taken possession of the Lenovo laptop on September 11th, it was connected to two separate Wi-Fi networks, meaning that the chain of custody had been breached. It was no longer in its original state. Basically, the laptop had been tampered with. Based solely on Gillum's statements regarding Joshua Cope, on September 14th, 2018, agents arrived at Cope's residence with a warrant, apparently finding 20 to 30 thumb drives, hard drives, media cards, and a couple more computers. Out of all of that hardware, they could apparently tell that five of the thumb drives had at some point been plugged into the Lenovo laptop in question. And of those five, agents suspected that three of them had at some point contained child essay material. Deleted files that the FBI was able to recover seemingly on the spot according to testimony. According to Agent Hill, while the search was conducted, her and the suspect, Joshua Cope, sat in her air-conditioned car just a couple miles away during the sweltering hot summer afternoon. She used a recording device to log her conversation with him, in which she asked him various establishing questions before she got to the point, which was asking him about the five thumb drives that had been found. On the recording, his only admittance of guilt of any kind was him acknowledging that a thumb drive named JC01 did belong to him. After they talked for a while, and Cope kind of admitted to owning one of these thumb drives by saying it was his, Agent Hill pulled Cope out of the car and they stood outside in the shade and, importantly, away from the recording device. And according to Agent Hill, it was at this point that Pope decided to basically admit to everything. Pope allegedly brought up his addiction to CP and spoke on the fact that his family had always struggled with various addictions and how he'd already researched all of these rehabilitation programs and come to one conclusion, that they don't work. Hill even claims that Cope said that people like him would be better off dead. Hill then retrieved the recording device and asked Cope to make another statement. And oddly, he didn't say anything about addiction or rehabilitation or CP or wanting to self-harm on the recording. Interestingly, he only made the comment that he can't trust any of this due to the fact that he doesn't remember any of it happening. Hill would later testify that the laptop in question was never fingerprinted. She said in court that she didn't find it to be necessary after her conversation with Cope. The issue with that is hearsay is not really admissible in court. And yes, you have all this digital evidence, but that can be tampered with, as it clearly was in this case. And when the investigation begins with this strange, mysterious laptop being in a place where it shouldn't be, a place where Cope works, it would actually be a major piece of evidence determining his guilt if his fingerprints were on the laptop. Cope didn't testify at his own trial. And in response to the defense pointing out the glaring mistakes and mishandling of the evidence in this case, the prosecutor made the slick argument that sometimes things just hide in plain sight, like the laptop and Mr. Cope. The defense made an interesting rebuttal, making the point that yes, things do hide in plain sight, and that it was interesting that the chief observer, Doug Gillum, had found this laptop stealth operating over the span of months five times and never did anything about it and then asked an FBI agent if he could wipe his fingerprints off of it. Some people in the true crime and conspiracy communities questioning whether or not the laptop was ever fingerprinted because the only set of fingerprints that would be found on the laptop would be Gillum's. Although this argument wouldn't fly with the jury who found Joshua Cope guilty on all counts. What was incredibly left unaddressed by the trial, state, and federal officials was the 11-day evacuation of the observatory complex and the community, the takeover of the post office, or the incredibly over, almost militaristic response by the FBI utilizing Black Hawk helicopters. Joshua Cope's alleged CP possession and distribution was the only excuse ever given, but people are arrested for things like this every day. Murderers, terrorists, cult leaders are arrested with less of a response, leaving many people, myself included, questioning the entire event. When things like this aren't explained, you kind of have to assume like an Occam's razor kind of perspective. So if they responded with this much force, they must have believed that Joshua Cope was an incredibly dangerous individual. But the glaring issue with that being that the timeline doesn't match with that whatsoever, nor does their behavior around Cope or their treatment of him really match up with him being a dangerous individual. The facilities and community were evacuated on September 9th. The laptop wasn't brought into evidence until September 11th, and the search warrant for Cope's residence wasn't executed until September 14th. 
I'll also point out that while that search warrant was being executed, a female FBI agent, Agent Hill, sat in her car with Cope, who was unrestrained at the time for multiple hours a mile away from all the rest of the agents. But that's not really telling me that the authorities were too worried about Cope as a threat. You may have noticed that throughout this entire video, I haven't shown an image of Joshua Cope. Not from his mugshot, nor his arrest, nothing from the trial or his life before. That's because as far as I or anyone else interested in this case could tell, there are no photos of Joshua Cope. And you know what conspiracy theorists are thinking. Does this guy even exist? And that was one of the biggest questions in the whole Sunspot Observatory mystery. I really googled my heart out. I used multiple search engines looking for pictures of him. I even paid for a records request to see if a Joshua Cope in New Mexico had been found guilty on these charges and I found nothing. But luckily, in a last-ditch effort, I searched his name on the New Mexico Corrections Department website. And to finally put at least this aspect of this conspiracy theory to bed, Joshua Lee Cope does indeed exist and is incarcerated in New Mexico for the distribution and possession of CP material. But that leaves us with the main question I still have about the Sunspot Observatory closure. Even though this guy's obviously real and has been incarcerated in New Mexico for these crimes, the government never explained why they had to evacuate the area or why any of the other stuff happened like the website closures. So my question to you is, do you remember this happening? Were you one of the people like me that were super invested in what was going on? And then when the story came out, you were just like, what? And if you were one of those people, what did you think was going on? Why do you think now that the observatory was closed and evacuated? So that's everything I have about the Sunspot Observatory mystery. If you enjoyed the video, give me a like and hit subscribe and turn notifications on. Every single interaction, like a like, a dislike, a comment, all of that stuff really goes so far to helping the channel grow. Once again, thank you guys so much and I'll see you very soon.